Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Decades before the hippie movement made free love an international phenomenon, love cults flourished all over Southern California. The first word of them spread in the middle 1920s and began making news a few years later like one nest of love on Santee Street where women were forced to speak in tongues, perform devil dances, and engage in soul mating with spiritual husbands. In 1939, the High Priestess Regina Cool captured the attention of the authorities when she was caught indoctrinating male students at LA City College in her Temple of Thelma. The temple was set up in the basement of one of the dorms, and there she would don robes, chant some suggestive passages from an Aleister Crowley book, and embrace the power of the lifted lance, or more simply put, engage in sex with multiple partners. In 1946, Henry King Daddy Newson was arrested for running his own sex camp called Ten Oaks. According to newspaper reports, he molested 16 underage girls over the course of two years. In his defense, he claimed that he was teaching them the beauty of sexual intercourse. Several of the girls claimed that he controlled their minds through hypnosis. The religious group known as the Blackburn Cult, the Divine Order of the Royal Arms of the Great Eleven, or the Great Eleven Club, was started around 1925. The group's founder, May Otis Blackburn, claimed to receive revelations directly from God and believed that she had been charged by the Archangel Gabriel to write books that revealed the mystery of heaven and earth, life and death. Apparently, Gabriel thought the goal of teaching the earth should be accomplished through strange rituals that involved animal sacrifice, copious amounts of sex between followers of the cult, and by stealing thousands of dollars from naive believers. The cult began to fall apart in 1929 after police officers made a gruesome discovery at the home of the Rhodes family on Vermont Avenue. Under the floor of one of the bedrooms was a specially built refrigerated sleeping chamber that contained the corpse of their 16-year-old daughter, Willa. The girl's body was covered in spices and salt and was surrounded by seven dead dogs. The Rhodes later confessed that they had placed the girl in the tomb at the direction of May Otis Blackburn, who convinced them that she would be resurrected when the Archangel Gabriel came to Earth. Group leaders were indicted later that year for theft and were also investigated in the disappearance of several members. The indictments made newspaper headlines 
when the strange rituals of the cult were revealed to the public. May Otis Blackburn was charged with 12 counts of grand theft, and the cult collapsed after she was sent to prison for stealing $40,000 from group member Clifford Dabney. Eerily foreshadowing the modern cult of Scientology, on which a religion is based on the writings of a science fiction novelist, was the Mankind United Sect, which was created by another science fiction writer, Arthur Bell. During the height of the Great Depression, Bell penned a book called Mankind United, a turgid, repetitive text that was filled with bold type and large blocks of capitalized text. It told the story of a malevolent conspiracy that ran the world, the hidden rulers and money changers, who were not only responsible for war, poverty, and injustice, they were also aliens living on Earth. Opposing them was another group of aliens, the Sponsors, who had arrived on Earth in 1875. According to Bell, the benevolent Sponsors were shortly going to announce their presence and would put in place a worldwide utopia based on universal employment and a financial system based on credits. The workday would be four hours a day, four days a week. Needless to say, all of this sounded pretty good to tired, worn-out people who were struggling to put food on their tables. In order for the sponsors to put their plan into place, they had to receive massive support from the people. The plan would be promoted by the Pacific Coast Division of North America International Registration Bureau, which was, of course, run by Arthur Bell. He announced that when 200 million people accepted the Mankind United plan, the sponsors would overthrow their rival alien groups and within 30 days the new utopia would begin. Of course, there were no sponsors, no evil aliens, and no international bureau. The whole thing had been concocted by Bell and it never numbered more than a few thousand followers, if that. The only true beneficiary of the group was Bell, who had several luxurious apartments and mansions, including a swanky place on the Sunset Strip that had an indoor pool, a pipe organ, and a cocktail bar. Bell was spotted in all of the most swinging nightclubs and spent cash freely. He received about $50,000 a year in tax-free income, which, adjusted for inflation, would be the equivalent of nearly $1 million today. His followers, on the other hand, worked in various cult businesses full-time, including hotels and shops. They were paid less than $40 a month, working up to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, which was quite a bit more than the utopian work week they had been promised in Bell's book. The cult gained the attention of the authorities during World War II. Bell incorporated as a church, the Church of the Golden Rule, to obtain tax exemption and began making even more bizarre claims, such as the idea that he could be beamed to several different places at once, that the sponsors had advanced technology that allowed the dead to be resurrected on other planets and more. None of these turned out to be quite enough to gain popular support, and in 1951 Bell's group folded and the cult faded away completely. As some would later discover, though, he was simply a man ahead of his time. If he had started his church a few decades later, he might be able to count some of the biggest stars in Hollywood as his members. Perhaps the strangest of the modern-day alien cults in Southern California was Heaven's Gate, a UFO religion that was based out of San Diego and led by Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles. At some point in the early 1970s, Applewhite became convinced that he was an alien who was transported to Earth and reincarnated into the body of a man named Marshall Applewhite. 
From that point on, he believed that it was his mission to teach everyone he came into contact with about the creed of transcendence. With the help of his partner, Bonnie Nettles, he gathered a number of followers and convinced them to give up everything that they owned, including their children, and to prepare themselves for the trip to the evolutionary level above human. Applewhite's preparation included months of extreme psychological mind control experiments, starvation, and celibacy. Some cult members even went as far as to castrate themselves. Although mostly unknown to the mainstream media, Heaven's Gate was known in UFO circles and had been the subject of criticism by respected UFO writer Jacques Vallée. In Messengers of Deception, he described an unusual public meeting organized by the group and expressed concerns about many UFO contactee groups' authoritarian, political, and religious outlooks, including the views of Heaven's Gate. The group's end coincided with the appearance of Comet Halebop in 1997. Applewhite convinced 38 followers to commit suicide, which he claimed would allow their souls to board a spaceship that they believed was hiding behind the comet. The cult believed that the planet Earth was about to be recycled or wiped clean and that the only chance they had to survive was to leave it immediately. On March 26, 1997, 38 members of the cult, along with Marshall Applewhite, were found dead in a rented mansion in the upscale San Diego community of Rancho Santa Fe. As the Hale-Bopp Comet approached the Earth, the group members drank citrus juice to ritually cleanse their bodies of impurities. The suicides were then accomplished by ingesting phenobarbital mixed with vodka and by tying plastic bags around their heads to induce asphyxiation. The cult members were found lying neatly on their bunk beds, their faces and torsos covered by a square purple cloth and plastic bags secured over their heads. Each member carried a $5 bill and three quarters in their pockets. All 39 were dressed in identical black shirts and sweatpants, brand new black and white Nike athletic shoes, and armband patches reaching Heaven's Gate away team. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook Hatched, Invisible Spiders Volume 1 by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. It is the morning hours in the small town of Hammond, and as the town wakes up, it finds that there is something spreading, something that is not seen until it is too late, because by then, you are already infected. At that point, they are already hatched. Here a sample of Hatched, Invisible Spiders Volume 1, on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. One of the most famous cults in Southern California was Krishnavenka's WKFL for wisdom, knowledge, faith, and love, and it began as a quiet monastery in Canoga Park in 1948. The Fountain of the World, as the group became known, first got the attention of the press in the 1940s and 1950s for its members' habit of dressing in robes and going barefoot. Male members were required to grow beards and wear their hair long. The fountain was marginally controversial because of the requirements for membership was that one donate all his or her worldly assets to the group prior to joining. For most members, this was irrelevant, since few of them had much to begin with. The group was responsible for a multitude of positives, including fighting wildfires, offering shelter to those in need and feeding the homeless. The group gained national exposure in 1949 when the newswires picked up the story that Fountain members had been among the first on the scene to offer aid to the victims of Standard Airlines Flight 897R, which had crashed into the Simi Hills, killing 35 of 48 persons on board. Krishnaventa also taught his followers 
to set up free food services for the poor, offer free room and board for the homeless, and help emergency relief groups in times of need. But things at the commune were stranger than most people knew. In addition to promoting charitable works, Venta also claimed that smoking was healthy, that human beings were evolved from aliens, that he was 244,000 years old and would never die. He did. That he arrived on Earth in 1932 on Mount Everest and led a convoy of rockets here from the extinct planet Neophrates. He also claimed that he was none other than Jesus Christ himself. To prove it, he liked to show his detractors he had been born without a belly button, proof he was Jesus, an alien or something. Krishnaventa had been born Francis Herman Panovic in 1911. He was married in 1937 and divorced seven years later. He was arrested in 1941 after sending a threatening letter to President Roosevelt. Later, using the name Frank Jensen, he committed a series of crimes including burglary, larceny, and kidnapping. He also spent a few months in a mental hospital. In 1948, he changed his name and founded his religion. He also got involved in the California legal system again when he was ordered to pay child support from 1945 to 1951. He claimed a religious exemption, but the court ruled against him in 1955. Vanta died on December 10, 1958, in a suicide bombing instigated by two disgruntled former followers, Peter Kamenov and Ralph Muller, who, although never offering any proof to support their claims, charged that Venta had both mishandled cult funds and been intimate with their wives. Krishna Venta is buried in Valhalla Memorial Park in Burbank. His grave is unmarked but near that of Oliver Hardy of Laurel and Hardy fame. A monument to Venta still exists in the canyon in Canoga Park where the commune once stood. A branch of the Fountain of the World cult was also established in Homer, Alaska in the years prior to Venta's death. Cult members were referred to as their barefooters by locals, but fountain membership at both sites declined rapidly following Venta's death and the cult ceased to exist entirely by the mid-1970s. The Process, or in full, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, began to flourish in the 1960s and 1970s. Its founders were an Englishman named Robert Moore, who later changed his name to Robert de Grimston, and Marianne McLean. It originally developed as a splinter cult group from Scientology, and Moore and McLean were declared suppressive persons by L. Ron Hubbard in December 1965. In 1966, the members of the group moved to Stull on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, where they developed their peculiar theology. They later returned and established a base of operations in the United States. The Process Church combined community activism with the peculiar belief that Jehovah, Christ, and Satan were not enemies but all equal parts of creation. The Process members were often viewed as satanic on the grounds that they worshipped both Christ and Satan. Their belief is that Satan will become reconciled with Christ and together they will come at the end of the world to judge humanity. Christ to judge and Satan to execute judgment. Like many cults of the time, the church depended on the youthful enthusiasm of its members, instilling control by separating them from friends and family and using general brainwashing techniques to keep them in line while the teacher, de Grimiston, and the oracle, McLean, waited for the end of the world. The world didn't come to an end, but the 1960s did with the Manson family murders. Manson was originally associated with the process by several writers, most notably in The Family, The Manson Group and Its Aftermath, a book about Manson written by Ed Sanders. Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecutor at the Charles Manson family trial, comments in his book Helter Skelter that there may be evidence Manson borrowed philosophically from the process church and that representatives of the church visited him in jail after his arrest. 
According to the representatives, the purpose of the visit was to interview Manson about whether he had ever had any contact with church members or even received any literature about the church, but that was all. As a result of a lawsuit, Ed Sanders' publisher agreed to remove the chapter about the process from the book in later printings. By the early 1970s, the group was beginning to fall apart. De Grimston began to show a predilection for the darker side of the cult's theology, wearing black robes, practicing animal sacrifices, and employing a swastika as his primary insignia. His increasing fascination with group sex and the importance of Satan in his writings alienated many members of the process, and besides that, Satan made fundraising more than a little difficult. De Grimston was ousted from the church in 1974, and a new group rose from the ashes called the Foundation Faith of the Millennium. The founders kept things going until the late 1970s, but by then were little more than a newsletter. The David Son of Sam Berkowitz slayings of 1977 didn't help the Splinter Group, as both the process and a supposed satanic fringe group were implicated in the murders. This conspiracy theory was promoted by a book called The Ultimate Evil by Maury Terry, which was released at the height of the Satanic Panic movement in 1987. However, there is no hard evidence that the process had anything to do with David Berkowitz or the Son of Sam murders, outside of Berkowitz's own confused and contradictory testimony. However, some believe that he might have been involved with a radical offshoot of the group that went far beyond anything that Robert de Grimston might have imagined. After being removed from the process, Robert de Grimston attempted to restart the process church several times, but he could never replicate his original following. The founders renounced de Grimston's doctrines and teachings, but were never really able to succeed without him. The organization has since ceased to operate. In 1969, while gathering material for a book on the Charles Manson case, journalist Ed Sanders encountered reports of a sinister satanic cult alleged to practice human sacrifice in several parts of California. Calling itself the 4Pi or 4P movement, the cult originally boasted 55 members. The leaders of the group were said to be middle-aged and the rest were young men and women in their early 20s. The group's founder, who was dubbed the Grand Shingen or Head Devil, was said to be a wealthy LA businessman and a former member of the Process Church, which might explain later confusion about the connections between the Process Church and various murders. The Grand Shingen compelled the younger members of the cult to act as his virtual slaves and ordered them to commit murders on command. The object of the cult? to promote the total worship of evil. Beginning in June 1968, the 4P movement allegedly began holding secret gatherings that were based on a stellar timetable and included the ritual sacrifice of Doberman and German Shepherd dogs. Soon after, law enforcement officers began discovering the dogs' corpses, skinned and drained of blood. According to later accounts by cultists, Members of the sect were drinking the blood of the dogs and later of their human victims. If these accounts are to be believed, the cult members sacrificed their victims, consumed their blood, and then removed and ate the victims' hearts. The evidence of the murder was then burned in a portable crematorium that was mounted on the back of a truck. The victims were reported to be mainly hitchhikers, drifters, and runaways, with occasional volunteers from within the ranks of the cult. In early 1969, the group fractured with one segment striving to de-emphasize satanic ritual and concentrate more on kinky sex, and the other clinging to the traditional blood and murder. According to author Maura Terry in the previously mentioned book, The Ultimate Evil, 
the group survived the schism and the traditional segment had expanded to 1,000 or more members across the country by 1979. Terry cited New York as one hotbed of activity where 85 German Shepherds and Dobermans were found skinned between October 1976 and October 1977. Along the way, the 4P movement allegedly brushed shoulders with a number of notorious killers, including Stanley Dean Baker, a purported member of the cult. When Baker was arrested on a moving violation charge in 1970, police found a human finger in his pocket. Baker claimed that it belonged to a human sacrifice victim and then took police officers to a site where he claimed to have buried a number of people for his church. Charles Manson and his family reportedly had contact with the 4P movement prior to making headlines in Los Angeles. Ed Sanders reports that some of Manson's followers referred to him in Sanders' presence as the Grand Shingen, distinguished from the original article by his age and the fact that Manson was jailed while the real Shingen remains at large. Likewise, family killer Susan Atkins later described the sacrifice of dogs by Manson's group, and searchers digging for the remains of Manson victim Shorty Shea reportedly found large numbers of animal bones at the family's campsite, which was more than a little strange for a group reputedly comprised of vegetarians. Convicted killer David Berkowitz, famous as the Son of Sam who terrorized New York in 1976 and 77, also professed membership in the cult, revealing inside knowledge of a California homicide allegedly committed by the group. In 1979, Berkowitz smuggled a book on witchcraft out of his prison cell, with passages on Manson and the 4P movement underlined. One page bore a cryptic notation in the killer's handwriting. Arliss Perry, hunted, stalked, and slain, followed to California. Author Maura Terry researched the information and found that it led to an unsolved murder that was committed at Stanford University in October 1974. On October 11, a young woman named Arliss Perry was found in the campus chapel at Stanford, nude from the waist down, a candle protruding from her vagina. Her blouse had been ripped open, and another candle stood between her breasts. She had been beaten and choked, and then an ice pick had been rammed into her skull behind her left ear. Berkowitz later claimed that Perry had been killed by 4P movement members as a favor to cultists in her hometown, Bismarck, North Dakota, whom she had apparently offended in some way. Despite the testimony of several reputed 4P movement members, authorities have yet to build a case against the movement, leading some to dismiss the cult as nothing more than scary stories created by sensationalistic writers and unhinged murderers like David Berkowitz looking for attention. Is the 4P movement truth or fiction or elements of both? Hope that you never find out for sure. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>